Well, hello, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in this wonderful world of ours. Um, I'm going to go over day, uh, this is day five of the boy in the box case, uh, the Tim Farrow trial. Him and his wife are being tried separately. Um, this was about six hours worth of footage. Now, I had a video yesterday or last night. It was eight hours, and then today when I got back on, it looked like the law and crime had revised it, and they cut out a lot of, I guess, the breaks. It was down to six hours, 18 minutes or something like that. But I had gone through it, picked out some highlight clips so we can highlight the testimony from yesterday. Now, right now, as I'm filming this, the prosecution is giving her um, closing arguments. Both of them are giving them their closing arguments. Now, I haven't watched the closing arguments yet. I watched a little bit of the, um, the back and forth on getting the jury uh, guidelines down for him to give those instructions to the jury. But I haven't watched the, um, the closing arguments yet. I wanted to get this out of the way, highlight the day, um, I mean, depending on how, how much they get done, if they're going to uh, have a verdict, I'll do a follow-up video if they do uh, today, or we'll have to wait till tomorrow, which would be Thursday. Um, so, this to me is the battle of the psychiatrists, <laughs> to some extent. Y'all remember the Depp and Turd trial? where you had uh, the crazy guy. <laughs> well, that was one of the psychiatrists she had, but they had a woman uh, psychiatrist that evaluated Amber Heard. And and then Depp had his, the, the, the beautiful blonde woman, um, where Depp's, not Depp's, but Heard's psychiatrist kept giving hearsay and all of this kind of stuff. Well, this is what was happening when I was watching the day five trial. I mean, she was admonished several times by the judge. She can't, you know, she can only give facts on what she's gone over. So that was pretty interesting. I just, I just thought there was a little bit of similarity of how both, between both different cases, how one uh, did, Myers didn't do that. I, I don't, I didn't hear her get objection for him saying hearsay. Uh, I don't recall that happening, but for her this morning, going over a lot of this, uh, she got admonished a couple of times by the, by the judge. She's going off in left field. Um, her name is Dr. Rappa, and, uh, we're going to start out, uh, now, I timed these clips, so the clip, this will be clip timestamp 32, uh, where she's talking about the parents, the parents' action, and was it therapeutic? Uh, I was just trying to grab highlights. Now, I'll put the link in the description if y'all haven't watched the whole trial and you needed to go back and see it, uh, then please do so. Okay, and here we go. So, do you have an opinion as to whether the Ferreter's actions were therapeutically correct? Yes. What's that opinion? Um, I think the Ferreter's actions were against anything that we would ever tell someone to do therapeutically. Is it fair to say that the way the Ferreter's handled this situation probably exacerbated these behavioral issues? Yes. But were th Well, that's... That didn't help the defense, her saying that. I mean, yeah, it acerbated it, all right. It wasn't therapeutic. Those behaviors that had caused by the ferreters, in your opinion? No, I don't believe so. I'll get into the specifics of that in a, in, in a minute. Um, does the fact... Okay. All right, this next clip I'm going to do is uh, timestamp at uh, 42 and some seconds. It's going to deal with the confinement and and I think that like they're they're trying to minimize and, and this is what the defense is doing. I mean, what else do they got? They've got to minimize the time the kid was in the box and trying to paint it well, he's he's unmanageable, 
he's this, he's that. So, you know, this is what the parents had to do. It was like their last resort, basically. I mean, they didn't come right out and say that, but you get the picture. So this segment is uh, talking about the confinement. And, and I think minimizing and putting him in the box. And also, she's going to ask him questions about about leftover food. Okay, here we go. Hey, Mr. Roger, you may continue. Thank you. Did you rely on records that showed and had behavioral issues prior to the age of eight and nine in coming to your various opinions in this case? Yes. Did you also rely on records um, that showed that did in fact have school suspensions? Yes. Would you characterize the uh, the time that was spent in his room? Would you characterize that as him having experienced solitary confinement for three consecutive years? Not really in terms of you think about three full years of somebody being in solitary confinement where they are having no stimulation, they're not getting out of their room, you know, nothing is going on like that. Um, so no. And there it is, minimizing his time. <laughs> oh, so he wasn't put in there for a full solid three years. I mean, any logical person would, would I mean, the jury's thinking, well, he was in there. <laughs> Of course he wasn't in there because he was going, obviously there was testimony he was going to school during the day and then they'd put him back in the box, right? Oh, I, I saw videos where he was out of the room, where he was eating with the family, where he was in the cul-de-sac or playing with the dog out back. Um, one, he was helping them clean up um, the yard. One, he was helping them all move in the house. One, he and Tim were sitting at a table having lunch together. Um, videos where he's watching football with the family. So, no, I didn't see it as, you know, he was locked in a room at the minute he gets home and then he's never let out of that room until school time. Were those videos that you reviewed? And there and there you have it. The, the, the only defense they have is to minimize the boy's time in the box. Whether it's going to play out with the jury is yet to be determined. Um, ring camera videos from the time period in Jupiter? Yes. Did you also review videos of him participating in meals with the family? Yes. Is there any evidence in the record that was only provided leftovers to eat? Sustained. Did you rely on any evidence in the record that showed that and was only given leftovers to eat? Overruled us to that question. You can answer, ma'am. Um, no, I did not see in records where he was only given leftovers to eat. Oh, and if I didn't mention, this is the defense's case. She, the defense is examining this witness. Okay, I want to get into your um, sort of specific opinions at this point. Do you have an opinion as to um, whether or not it has? He, they're going to go over in this clip because I'm going to, I'm letting it flow over. Uh, I believe it's reenactment disorder. Um. I believe that's what she's going to be discussing right here. A lack of inhibition and emotional regulation. Yes. What is your opinion as to that issue? Um, I believe that struggles and has clinically significant signs of lack of inhibition and emotional regulation. What did you rely on in coming to that opinion? Um, well, there were a number of things, but one thing in particular is he had a neuropsych um, a neuropsych done in 2022. And so that report was very helpful to me in, in determining how his brain was functioning. You said neuropsych, what is that? Um, neuropsychological testing is um, a psychologist that focuses on neuro, that focuses on the brain, and the testing then shows skills and abilities that the brain is, is able to do. So they're gonna go on, on that, his lack of inhibition, and things like that. And um, she will be touching upon reenactment, reattachment disorder, right? So she's gonna go on to say, to really go in depth. And she does a phenomenal job, this, this therapist. I thought she did a pretty good job of describing uh, the, some of the elements of what, of what that is and the, the reaction of a child, like hoarding food, um, he, they eat a lot. They, they want to control their environment, control everything around them. 
and they have like a disassociation uh, with if, if they do bad things, they don't realize it causes harm to the people around them. And and then she's going to touch upon like he like he laughed in an inappropriate time, especially in his deposition uh, when he described giving the kid, giving his little brother uh, some beer and the kid was four. But a lot of the time she's saying he was kind of stoic faced and, and he would comment. So what he says regularly doesn't reflect on his facial expressions and and things of and things of that nature. Okay, this clip we're going to go over is the, the judge admonishing the witness about only uh, communicating on the records that she has gone through and not to give hearsay to hearsay, right? So th this is him uh, getting on to her. <laughs> the court is reconsidering its prior ruling on the, um, the question of whether there were any recommended treatments. Um, Ms. Murad, you can ask the witness that question with respect to um, her review of the records that she um, had presented to her in this matter. But um, ma'am, just so you know, you're only able to answer that question with respect to the records you reviewed. You're not allowed to get into that with respect to anything else anybody else may have said to you, because uh, that would be hearsay. But if there's something in the records that can form a basis for you to answer the question, I'll allow you to do that. Okay. okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Based on the records that you reviewed in coming to your various opinions in this case, is there any evidence that the ferreters were recommended those treatments that you just mentioned? No. Is there any evidence in the records that you reviewed that they were recommended inpatient treatment for attachment disorder? No. Is there any evidence in the record that the ferreters were recommended to go to a specialist for attachment disorders? No. And just so we're clear, Ms. Murad, you're talking about the records that she reviewed, yes. not in the record in the global sense of this proceeding. Yeah, yeah. The ones I don't know how if this questioning is helping defense where, I mean, I could be wrong, where she just kept, keeps asking her, well, they weren't ever recommended to, to seek um, therapy for his reattachment syndrome, you know, that, you know, this happened to him as a baby. So they didn't have this given to them by these other psychiatrists and doctors or whatever. So still minimizing what their actions were by this type of testimony. Do you have? Yes. All right. I want to go into... Um... Your Honor, my next opinion does require me to approach. I'm wondering if it's a good time for a break. Yeah, it is good because we've been going about an hour and a half. This okay, so I'm going to zip through that break here in just a moment. Uh, the next clip we're going to see, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's going to be time stamped at one hour and 23 minutes. And they're going to talk about protecting the child's privacy. Whether he was better or not, or since he's been taken away from the family, right? Is he better since he got taken away, or is he still the same? And the judge is like, "No, we're not. Ha we can't testify that because there, because there's privacy of the child, right? And and that did this improve uh, with the with the with the care of the Federer family? It doesn't reflect on." or take away from the treatment and abuse of putting him in a box, right? So that's what they're going to be talking about. Now, they're going to be talking about this without the presence of the jury. All right, uh, you need to approach. But um, I thought it was could interesting. We, just do it? We, can, we can do it. Here. So, Judge, um, the court has that's not my mic. sort of made a preliminary ruling on this, but I wanted to readdress it before I asked Dr. Rappa. So in the... Um, in the cross-examination, actually I think it was in the direct or redirect examination of Wade Myers. Wade Myers opined that when you remove a child from the environment that they're in that's causing issues with their attachment. So specifically, and we listened to this yesterday, so Wade Myers agreed that he has probably an attachment disorder from before, from his early childhood when he was adopted. He then said that it was, quote, brought back by the Faraday.
And Probably. he then said that if he is placed in a different situation or environment, or children with attachment issues are placed in a different situation or environment, you expect to see an improvement in their behavior. I guess we'll never know because they they were doing this in Arizona before they even came to Florida. They were locking him up in a room then, and they were seeing signs that they were having issues with, with the boy by the time he was eight, nine years old. So they've been doing some crazy stuff for a long time, and I guess if he was in a different family, obviously we'll never know if it if it did or didn't affect the outcome of his behavior by choosing this path. And so I believe, based on the records that Dr. Rappa has reviewed, that at the very least, the defense should be able to counter that position to show that that improvement has not, in fact, happened because there is an issue. And there it is fear of the persistent reactive attachment disorder and how the ferreters couldn't have really done anything to improve it. Um, and it is direct rebuttal to what the state's own expert testified to. Um, so I would like to get into that and I'm sure the state will be objecting. All right, so Ms. Coakley, um, make sure you use a mic and state what your position is. There is a fundamental difference between saying generally this is how it is addressed, which is what Dr. Rappa has already testified to, that generally how it's addressed is that they, it focuses on the parenting in a nurturing, safe parenting environment. There's a fundamental difference between that testimony and saying that that would have solved it in this case, which is not what his testimony was. He testified generally. Beyond that, it's much more complex and nuanced than the defense wants to make it seem. It's not an automatic uh, solution. I don't think any psychiatrist or psychologist would say that, especially after three years of additional trauma uh, perpetrated by the defendants, but then oh to God. go into every single thing that has occurred to the child after. So what is the legal basis of your objection? Is it foundation? Is it relevancy? It's, it's improper character evidence, Your Honor. And, and whether or not the child in this case was cured after being removed from the parents is not a relevant determination That's right. for the jury. That doesn't have any bearing on whether or not the defendants committed a criminal act in this case. Whether well, that or not sounds was, like a relevancy objection to me as well. Right. It's a, yeah, it's like nuance. So the, yeah, it's not going to negate that they stuck him in a room and turned the light out with a bucket. It doesn't negate it. I don't see how it can. It's like the idea is first that it's improper character evidence that confuses the issues and prejudicial and prejudice is prejudicial because it gets into such a complicated issue. But set, so it's your honor in, in limine said that that is not permissible. It's improper character. evidence. And, and that's right. And that's why Ms. Murad um, said I'd already preliminarily ruled on right. it. But beyond that, it's not even relevant because like how easy or how hard it was to deal to manage their child is not a defense um, to the criminal charge here. And so whether or not he was able to or continue to have behaviors after they were removed is not relevant to the determination. And that's huge. That is huge against the defense that it is not relevant. It doesn't negate the fact of what they did. It's too bad the jury can't hear none of this. <laughs> I guess we get the uh, privilege of hearing this and, you know, it really enlightens our and changes our opinions one way or the other nation of the defendant's intent or knowledge in this case or whether or not they committed a criminal act of child abuse all right um, final remarks on it miss moran and I, i'll help you out with at least the concern i have is i i think it's completely irrelevant whether the child gets well or not after he's removed from the home because i agree with the state's position that whether the child gets better or not does not decide the issue of whether the treatment and the conduct of the parents in dealing with the child prior to the child's removal was appropriate or not to the circumstances. You've testified as to the circumstances that, or you've had your witness testify as to the circumstances that existed while the child was at home, and that was with the reactive attachment disorder. Um, so that's appropriate but now and that's relevant because that's what they're dealing with in real time and it, it guides and determines their conduct their response to a, a minor child having reactive attachment disorder but what happens after the child's removed I, I have a real difficult time connecting the dots because it's irrelevant to the parents conduct 
that they um, pursued while the child was with them there and is. while they were dealing with the issue. Yeah. So that's my major concern is it's just not relevant. And um, uh, why should I change my pretrial ruling um, uh, already made in this case that I was and he he doesn't change his ruling. He keeps he keeps staying. He's not going to let them go down that road. He's just not going to let them do it. Okay, so this next clip, it's at timestamp 146, and it's going to deal with uh, malicious intent. And she's going to go over. I, I I don't know. The defense just is. I don't understand. But again, what what else do they got? So they're going to bring that up because they're trying to def defute what the other psychiatrist was saying that, yeah, he used the term malicious. We know all that, that big, big thing. And I think they're putting it in the jury instructions to give them a definition of it. It's completely ridiculous. But still, they're pushing the narrative. The kid is bad. Parents did what they could. So uh, this is what she's going to talk about. And, um, and let's do it. Let's see what they're going to say. Their opinion of yours. So, um, you did in fact review the trial testimony and the deposition of Dr. Wade Myers, correct? Yes. And Dr. Wade Myers testified that the ferreters engaged in malicious punishment. Is that correct? Yes. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not the ferreters did in fact engage in malicious punishment? Yes. What is that opinion? Um, I, I don't believe that they were malicious insofar as they were deliberately trying to abuse and hurt their child. I think that they were responding to behaviors that they were very concerned about, and they were trying. It, it's almost like they went into a let's, let's contain and monitor and make sure that nothing's going to happen. Did they do something appropriate? No. Did they handle it appropriately? No. Um, but I don't think it was just an arbitrary, I'm going to abuse this child, be cruel to this child um, for no reason. I think in their mind, they were trying to contain some behaviors and keep everybody safe in the process. Now, she had a point, I, I guess, <laughs> right? I mean, what she said was sound, but, and then again, no. Because it's still, it just, after she says that, I'm like, well, that, that does make sense. But then again, my mind goes right back. You, or that video where you, you're you screaming at the kid, and then you slam the door, lock it, and kick the light out, and he's crying, and the kid's in the dark. What if he's got to pee? He's got to crawl around on the ground to find the bucket? It's It's still, it's just insane how they, you know, handled it. It... it it is malicious. I don't know if it was a malicious intent. That's another, that's another, that's a question for the jury. But he, they did it. It's done. And now it's just debating that. Now this next clip at an hour and 51, we're moving right along because it, like I said, it's a six hour video, but I'm trying to squeeze this down as, as best I can. I feel like the defense again is reaching in this clip. Uh, the the psychiatrist is still on the stand, and she's she's basically saying that maybe he's a threat to himself or or he's a threat to others, still negating the parents' actions of abuse, and and the judge is just not letting it in at, at this at this point because he's saying it doesn't take away from from the abuse of trying to establish that. Um, since the kid was bad, they had to do this and, you know, to, again, minimizing, minimizing, uh, the situation with them putting him in a box. And the one of them made a comment that it just, is, it's just not fair. Here we go. Yes, go ahead. So, Judge, in the Dr. Rappa was deposed twice, once on September 20th by the state, a second time on September 27th by the state. And this this is not in front of the jury as well, but I just thought it was really interesting and worth putting it in here, them discussing this. Um, 
the state asked on page the bottom of page 11 of the first deposition, I want to just kind of start with what opinion you expect to give in this case. It gets very lengthy, but she states several opinions that she would give. Um, this includes, I think as they, so I think as they, as he kind of got older and his behaviors got what they thought were more dangerous or more intense in terms of feeling or in terms of hurting other people or hurting themselves, that they, you know, started thinking that we need to manage these behaviors and the behaviors are so out of control, how can we manage them? And of course, the way they chose to manage them was probably the worst way anyone ever could. Then she said, what else? Um, uh, and that was on page 12. Line, I'm sorry, page 13, line 7 through 15, where Dr. Rappa describes sort of at length what her opinion is, and then the state goes specifically. In the second deposition that the state took, I had asked uh, Dr. Rappa whether or not in a clinical setting she makes determinations about whether or not a child is a danger to themselves or others. Um, Ms. Coakley specifically, and that was on the second deposition taken on September 27th of 2023 by the state, page 35, line 7 through 15. And keep in mind how much time the defense has wasted, because this is the second time I've played a clip where they're not in front of the jury, because she's arguing, they're wanting to argue to, again, get, the kid was bad, get that in there. Was he, was he, is he better or not better since he left the home? They're just trying to minimize the the abuse of putting him in the box. It's just a reoccurring theme. And and I'm sure y'all all know the defense rested after this. And it just doesn't make any sense. And, and like I said, I, this is six hours here. I'm squeezing it down as quick as best I can. But they've wasted so much time. On, uh, this is day five uh, footage. They have wasted so much time, and they really didn't put anybody on. They didn't even put anybody on, and they're just still trying to get this in there, and the judge is just not having it. The state also asked uh, Dr. Rappa, this was regarding something different um, that was said in the CPT interview um, about whether or not is it appropriate to, as a child is using the restroom, sort of have the door open as there were allegations of that in the CPT interview. And Dr. Rappa said that, that where there is a danger, that is something that happens in a clinical setting. And that is on page 19 of the September 27th deposition. Um, it's sort of at the end of page 18 all the way to page 19 ending at line five. As to the oppositional defiant disorder, that is on the September 20th, 2023 deposition, page 38, line eight. Let me just get there. This is the state's questioning of Dr. Rappa. It starts on page 37. Um, I think on page 38, the relevant line numbers would be line, starting at line two. Ms. Coakley says, and there's also several other disorders that can share symptoms or overlap or share features, right? Rap, Dr. Rappa says, yes, conduct disorders can. I see you nodding. You just have to say yes. Um, Dr. Rappa responds, yes. The state then asks oppositional defiance disorder, and Dr. Rappa says, yes. And then she lists several other um anxiety disorders, social what phobias, she lists several other things. So I think um, in, in addition to the depositions in the records um, that the state was provided has been diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder and reactive attachment disorder. Ms. Narod, in any of those, because what you just read doesn't even get close in my view of being an opinion being rendered by this witness as to whether she had, based on her review of the records, reached an opinion as to whether ODD was applicable or based on her review of the record, she had reached an opinion uh, that the child victim was a danger to himself. Just mentioning ODD or uh, the, the, you know, being a threat to someone's self is not the same as an expert providing an opinion as to whether that is, in fact, her conclusion. Do you have anything that indicates that Do that you was got her anything? conclusion Give that me she something. was drawing, that the child victim in this case 
was suffering from ODD or was a danger to himself as to which the parents had to respond? I don't have anything additional to what I've already cited on the record, Your Honor. However, I will I say nothing. that the idea that the state was not on notice or able to explore this in their own deposition, just as we <coughs> were in our deposition of Wade Myers. And they didn't have to. Um, I think is uh, not fair. All right. Well, it, not it, fair. whether it's fair or not, I'm not going to comment, but both counsel, both sides know that. Uh, <laughs> Of course, he's not going to let it go through. And I thought that was an odd thing for her to say. Well, it's just not fair. It's just not fair that we can't do this, that we just can't do that. It's just not fair. Okay, so this next clip, it's at uh, mile marker two hours and four minutes, and we're 30 minutes into this. So we're doing pretty good on time. Um. She's going to try, the, the defense is going to try to get testimony asking the witness about the child exhibiting dangerous behavior. And again, the same theme, this dangerous behavior compelled the parents to do this. Basically, that's the underlining tone. And the judge is just not having it because it's, it's it, it can't take away from what the parents' actions or abuse was, right? So, uh, let's check it out. Or him searching his laptop for something which they never, they never said, other than he was looking up a game or something, but who knows. All right, objection sustained. Mr. Um, Murad, you may continue. Is it your opinion that the ferreters were responding to this behavior? I'm going to overrule in part, sustain in part. You can answer it, but it has to be solely with reference to what you observed and reviewed in the records that you reviewed in uh, connection with your opinions as an expert in this matter. Do you ask again? Sure. Um, is it your opinion that the ferreters were responding to behavior? Yes. And is that behavior uh, indicative of early childhood trauma? Yes. Do we see... Ronan's behaviors are the ones that the ferreters are responding to. Now, this is important because she said uh, from his early childhood trauma that we know what the other psychiatrist is saying that, well, his, by him examining everything, is that the trauma most likely is worse because of the ferreters' treatment of the boy. So... I'm, I'm hoping the jury's taking notes because that's what I got from it. Okay, they're defuting that. But then again, remember the other psychiatrist's testimony. Prior to May of 2018. Sus sustained. Um, did you rely on records in coming to your opinion before 2018? Yes. No further questions. All right, uh, Cross, Ms. Copeland. Let's see. I believe this, she's going to continue on. Now we're on the prosecution cross-examination. Uh, I believe she's going to be covering um, parents responding to the behavior. And this is the prosecution cross-examining her. And the, the defense has already rested. I mean, rested with this witness. I mean, no further questions. It's... It, I don't I don't see how it gained any ground for them whatsoever. Good morning. So you were hired in the by the defense in this case. Yes. Um and you charged them a fee. What was your fee in this case? Um I I charged three hundred and fifty dollars an hour. As of today I have made five thousand dollars. I don't know why they have to ask that, but I've noticed in a lot of trials they do. I mean these people get paid. They're experts. They probably went to school for a long time. They probably deserve to get paid. So I don't know how that's, if the jury's like, oh, man, she's just getting paid to say what we want her to say. I, I think that's might be the tactic. I don't know. I mean, I don't think, uh, to some extent, I mean, she can only say what she's going to But of course she's siding with the defense. But is she being factual or truthful? because she's getting paid for it, that, that's a big ethical question right there. And then there'll be an additional amount for testimony today, that is preparation. More money. Thing, correct? Yes. 
Now, um, today, your, your work is mostly in the courts. Correct, 100%. Right, um, and mostly criminal cases, correct? Not necessarily, I do a lot of civil cases also. Uh, uh, but as a court psychologist or a forensic psychologist, um, I'm gonna move this up a little bit, I apologize. All right, so the prosecution, we're at two, two hours and eight minutes. Um, she's gonna be asking her questions about how the parents manage the behavior of the child and the parents' treatment of the child. Was it harm? Um, was it recommended to them to do this kind of treatment this way? And here we go. Did you review the records similar to Dr. Myers? Yes. And when I say that you reviewed the records, there's records from some prior practitioners. Um, you didn't speak to them either, correct? I did not. Now, I want to talk about your opinion. You can't give a diagnosis in this case, correct? I would feel very uncomfortable giving a diagnosis without interviewing someone. Okay. And so part of that is that you have insufficient information to make a definitive diagnosis, correct? Right, because I'm missing that, that um, interview portion. But uh, you do have an opinion on whether or not the defendant's actions were an appropriate way to manage the behaviors in this case. Now, let me bring up something that was said earlier, and I didn't play that clip where the defense slipped it in and the judge asked the jury to disregard when she may probably or not, because she didn't get a chance to uh, interview uh, the boy. And that, that got out. So the jury knows it for whatever reason. She only had access to depositions, testimony, uh, and and some doctor's records. Yes, correct. Yes. Um, it is your opinion that they the way that they chose to manage the behaviors is probably the worst way anyone could ever manage these type of behaviors. Correct. That's correct. <laughs> Ouch. Now, although you can't make a diagnosis, you think that there are indications um, that the child in this case has complex, PT complex PTSD as well as an attachment disorder, right? Yes. And if a child does have an attachment disorder or complex PS PTSD, the way the defendant acted towards the victim is the complete opposite of what anyone should have done with a child with one of those conditions, correct? Yes, ma'am. In fact, confining and isolating a child can exacerbate those disorders, correct? Oh my God. That's right. And so exacerbate means make those symptoms worse. Yes. Correct. This is brutal. <laughs> so she is agreeing with all of these things. They did agree even under uh, direct cross that uh, the, the parents shouldn't have done this. <laughs> I mean, what else are they going to say? This, this is just crazy how this this is going. Just crazy. Okay, the prosecution just went through a series of questioning her about a whole list of the incidents. Uh, went, you know, hit the sprinkles, the, you know, all of these other things of him getting in trouble in school. But I thought this was good that she brought she brought this up. Here we go the garage that they built for him in Arizona, correct? Yes, he would be by then. A fifth grader, 11 years old. Correct. And then March... So all of this happened in Arizona, and he was put in a box uh, during that time. All right, this next clip, she's going to be going... The, the prosecution's still crossing her, cross-exam, and they're going to talk about the ongoing abuse throughout his life. Hopefully I got it in the right spot. That was neuropsychological um, report that results, and there was, in part, some difficulties um, in executive function and impulse control, correct, right? That was two of the things that that report found, correct? Yes. Um, and both of those things can be the result of trauma, correct? Yes. And ongoing abuse throughout a child's childhood could make issues with executive functioning worse. Absolutely. It also could make, if there's ongoing abuse throughout childhood, it can make issues with impulse control worse, correct? Yes. Any anytime you take a child who has an early childhood abuse or neglect, and then you add to that 
it's going to exacerbate any symptoms that they have, correct? Yes, and I'm going to let this continue to play through because they're going to also talk about the confinement. Did it make it worse? And what the, uh, the psychiatrist answers. Yes. So if you take a child that has early childhood neglect or an adverse childhood experience, right? Like in the orphanage, that would be an example of an adverse childhood experience, typically, correct? If you take a child like that and then you subject them to additional ongoing abuse that might exacerbate their symptoms, correct? For sure. Yeah. Now, the report that we're talking about also talked about that um, the victim in this case had some difficulties in executive functioning, correct? Yes. And the way in which he was treated has a risk of increasing those difficulties, correct? Yes. He also had, we call, you called it some difficulties in self-monitoring. Um, the way that he was treated would increase the difficulties in self-monitoring, correct? Sure. You also mentioned that he has, it was determined that there's some difficulties with emotional regulation, correct? Yes. The way that he was treated would increase his difficulties with emotional regulation, correct? <laughs> now, a child that has um, these characteristics that you said that is clinically, were clinically significant, it is never an appropriate treatment for those types of clinically significant difficulties the way he was treated, to confine him. Yes, you're right. You also noted that there was some difficulties in impulse control, but confinement is never an appropriate treatment for those difficulties either, is it? That's correct. And there it is, <laughs> the confinement. It probably wouldn't have mattered what psychiatrist the defense hired to get on the stand. There's no way a psychiatrist is gonna get on the stand and go, yeah, it was okay. It was okay to confine him for, you know, 10 hours at a time in pitch black with a bucket in the room to crap and pee in. There's just no way. And it just, it's just mind boggling how this is, how this is playing out for the defense. And well, we know he's going to appeal if it, if it doesn't hit, but I don't, I don't, even so far in her testimony, it is, it hasn't helped him at all. It hasn't minimized what they did. Okay, this is going to be a little bit of a long clip, maybe two and a half minutes, and they're going to be going over um, that there hadn't been much behavioral aggression with the kid. They're going to be going over the meds, and they're going to be going over was he cruel to pets. And that I thought that was interesting. So they're they're going to be talking with that, and here you go at the report that the parents uh, reported to their psychiatrist that they were seeing for the behavioral problems of their child that he is not having severe aggressive behavior at school. That's what the parents report, correct? Yes. Um, and they also noted adequate behavior at school regarding focus and hyperactive behavior, correct? Yes, he had been placed on medication at that time. And then the doctor decided at that point that the that the treatment going forward would be to continue medication and therapy, correct? Yes. But there was a problem because the parents were going to go away for the summer, so he might not be able to get that therapy. I don't remember why they didn't, but they didn't get the therapy at that time. Now, in January 23rd... There was a lot of therapy. They didn't get that boy. ...2019, uh, they also went back to Dr. Uh, Reichenberger, correct? Yes. And there... Their, the chief complaint that his parents brought was that he has some anger, correct? Yes. Um, and the mom reported some improvements in his ability to not get angry or apologize and later on, correct? Yes. And the child got tearful when his mom was talking about him, correct? That's what the report said, yes. And they reported that he had not uh, been seeing a therapist at that That's point. Correct. And the doctor, again, recommended that they should do medication and meet with a therapist, correct? Correct. At no point uh, did uh, Dr. Reichenbacher report con uh, recommend confinement. Never. To the parents. Uh, so nobody told him to do that. Nobody on the planet told him to do that. And... At no point did the parents report that there was issues with the child hurting animals, correct? To that doctor? To Dr. Rockenbarker. Right, to that no. doctor, no. 
Um, and I think that you mentioned that that was something that may have existed in this case, but isn't it true that the only issue that he ever had with an animal is when he overfed a dog? No, he had been riding a bicycle and was riding the bicycle into the dog. Okay, so he hit the, bi the dog with a bicycle? Yes. And you know that um, in 2022, in January, at the time that we're talking about um, from reviewing the videos, that there were times where the child is allowed to be alone with the dog? No, I didn't. You didn't see that? There's times I, I did maybe... see him out with the dog, but he wasn't, the family was around. Okay. Did you see any of the videos where he's alone with the do one of the dogs in the room, in his, in, the, in his structure in the garage, locked in the room, and the dog's in there? Oh, I didn't recall that. No. Okay. And there's other times that family had multiple pets where he's allowed to be around with the pets? Yes. Correct? I mean, I definitely saw him with the family with the pets. Now, going back to reactive um, attachment disorder, social um, and the diagnostic criteria, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to let this play because uh, this is good. The reattachment disorder, um, they're gonna be touching upon that, and I thought it was really good. I'm thinking it's it's either three to five minutes long. We'll see how long the, this goes. I have in my notes it's uh, two thirty to to two thirty five, but it's really good. And I, I just I just thought it was as interesting how how they were breaking it down so you get an idea of what the syndrome does. Social neglect is a necessary condition, meaning that there has to be a time in the early childhood where their child was subject to extreme neglect, correct? Right. But it doesn't necessarily mean that just because that occurred that a child is going to have reactive attachment disorder, correct? That's right. Um and when a person has reactive attachment disorder, there's actually two types, correct? Yes, it's been divided into two types. There's one where the child is overly affectionate, almost indiscriminate with their affections towards adults. Yes. That does not seem to be the case here. There's no indication of that. No. So that's not what we're talking about here. Correct. Um, the other one is when <laughs> the child um, has difficulty forming attachment, correct? Yes. And there's nothing in the criteria or what we're looking at in diagnosing it that has anything to do with violence. No, it's only if the child will um, refuse to be comforted by a caretaker or will not go to the, com to the caretaker to be comforted. So it's very um, specific. Okay, so you saw and we know in the first part of the testimony that the mother, well, I think it was said by the first psychiatrist, and then him him referring to the notes that the mother had said um, that the child just didn't respond to her, like he didn't, you know, as as a child, he he didn't want to be comforted by her. A lot of times, see a child that appears withdrawn or unable to be comforted by an adult. Um, they're not necessarily withdrawn but they're unable to be comforted. So they're, they're having intense temper outbursts and the parent goes to comfort them and they don't want that. It makes it worse actually. Or the child hurts himself or is out of control emotionally and won't go to that parent for soothing. So it's a very disturbed way, way of attaching. Right. And this happens with psychology. They have discovered this in studies that like the first I guess a year to two years, or maybe it's one to three years of their life, a child's life, that they need that connection with a parent or a caregiver who shows them love when they cry, go pick them up. And then the child starts instinctively knowing, oh, if I'm hungry, they're going to feed me. And they start trusting this person. So they build a connection. And apparently this is very vital in all of our uh, growth in life to be able to connect with people, to have empathy with people. And, 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 you know, this thing, the first few years is so crucial for this connection that if this connection's not made, one, either they can get better with, with another household that they might, because they said this earlier that yes, some children can rebuild that and start to grow, and some never do. So I don't know if this boy don't don't have a crystal ball, but this is possible. There's only two scenarios. Either, yeah, if they're in a loving home 
and they start making the connections over time, they can have a, a nice, wonderful life. Second is they, they don't, or it takes them deep into their adulthood to get this connection, or they just never do. And that, that's pretty sad. That's pretty sad. And we don't know the first seven months of his life where he was. Then he goes to the orphanage, I, I believe it's seven months, and then they adopt him at like 17 months or something like that. So God knows the poor kid, what what, what went on. But he said, They said he had scabies. He was in bad shape. They were feeding him sugar water in this orphanage in Vietnam. I mean, it's just terrible. So all of that didn't come out. He didn't. He didn't make a connection with with Mrs. Um, Ferreter, or or with him. So there wasn't that connection. Right, but there's nothing in the criteria that says that the child has to react towards herself or others in a way that involves violence. No, I mean not necessarily. But when you look at it, and when you look at reactive attachment disorder as it is studied. These are the behaviors that are seen in the studies when people are diagnosed with this. Now, when people are diagnosed, um, the DSM tells us to, and I think you've already agreed, that after five, it should be done with extreme caution. And that's in part because it is unclear if reactive attachment disorder even occurs after the age of five, correct? Sure. So what happens is many people, um, some people are in the camp that you know, you can have persistent reactive attachment disorder that goes through middle childhood, through adolescence, into adulthood. Some people are of the camp that, hey, it's reactive attachment disorder, but really what's underlying it is that complex PTSD, and that's why we see it continue throughout the lifespan. So it really just depends on what camp you're in. There, there's a little bit of research for both. Now, according to the DSM, it, the reactive attachment disorder is incredibly rare, correct? Yes, it's not something that you would see often in your practice. Um, and you're familiar, um, and it's something that is considered um, that has a high risk of misdiagnoses, correct? I think that it did back in the day when it first, when people were first hearing about it and calling everything that a child did rad, you know, everything was rad. I think now um, clinicians are way more cautious about diagnosing, but when you see somebody like Ronan that has that really severe neglect, malnutrition, scabies, I don't think that it's a leap. I think it's a, it's, you know, it makes sense. And yeah, if they have the background of the child, then yeah, you can make that diagnosis on his behavior. Well, you're a member of the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, correct? I am a member, yes. Um, and that is, it goes by the acronym ABSAC. Um, and as a member, you stay up to date on the professional recommendations and also ABSAC's positions on the latest research and community standards for the treatment and the, uh, for child abuse, correct? Uh-huh, correct. Um, and ABSAC, the task force, issued a report on attachment disorders and attachment problems, correct? They did. And the report points out that, um, the, that reactive attachment disorder is actually incredibly rare, correct? I agree with that. And they also point out it's also known that there is an inappropriately high number of children misdiagnosed with those, especially those who have only a mild or moderate symptoms, correct? Yes. And the report points out that, and I think you already discussed, that there is incredibly abusive ways in which sometimes reactive attachment disorder gets uh, treated. Yes. Uh, that includes extreme control over every action that the child has, correct? In extreme circumstances. Yes, it's parents that are desperate parents trying to control these behaviors, and they're controlling these behaviors in ways that are that are detrimental to the child. That are harmful. Now, that was a good point she made, um, I think, because uh, extreme measures is detrimental to the child. And uh, obviously, the Federers, this was extreme. Yes. Um, and the report points out that one of the key things for treating reactive t attachment disorder or ways in which it is recommended in general to be treated is it focuses on actually the actions of the parent as opposed to the child. That's correct. Um, wow. Nailed it. The most effective therapies actually don't rely upon the child, correct? 
Um, it's mostly teaching the parent how to parent that type of child because they, uh, parents think, especially foster parents or, or adoptive parents, think that love is enough. And if they just lavish this child with love, this child's going to get better. And it's very frustrating for that parent when they're trying to do all they can and the child is not changing or getting worse. I, want I, I think this therapist did a pretty good job, though. I mean, I, I liked her answers. She seems to be, you know honest and truthful about it and uh i mean how can she refute any of that i want to talk about hoarding food hoarding hoarding stealing food is something that you see commonly in children that have a history of deprivation or come from deprived okay so she's just going to go about uh this is another symptom of uh the detached uh syndrome of of hoarding the food Let's see. All right. So this next line of questioning is uh, they're going to talk about the defense's actions made things worse, which Tim Federer, the parents, uh, just regurgitating. But her answers are good. The question is good. I thought it was relevant. Um, yes, most likely. It's your opinion that the way that his parents handled the symptoms from PTSD exacerbated it, correct? I do believe that. And this is not a way that a child with early childhood neglect should be parented, correct? That's right. That hurt. <laughs> I mean, just that right there, that simple little, that simple little phrase. No, they shouldn't have done that. Mm -mm. <laughs> they shouldn't have done that. All right, I thought this clip was interesting where they're going to talk about um, the prosecution still um, cross-examining her on how a child who's being abused adop adopts or accepts the abuse. Like, I guess it becomes natural, I guess, in their everyday life, basically. Now, in cases um, involving abuse and neglect, can the child who is exposed to ongoing abuse grow to to um, grow a tolerance for the environment that they're in? Overruled. Yes. Um, and so <laughs> even in cases where that environment that they're... Now, remember when, when the boy was on the stand, he had said something that stood out to me. Now, I didn't do... I didn't cover any of his testimony. Um... But I did watch it. And he had said that he doesn't hold any ill will towards Tim and his wife, the Federers, that they did what they thought they had to do uh, for him. They did what they thought they had to do. And I thought that was, that must mean he was he was accepting the abuse. Like, yeah, I'm bad. So they throw me in a room, turn the light out. He was, he's basically saying, yeah, they, it's okay. I don't hold any ill will towards them. Subjected to is abusive or neglectful. Sure. Yeah. So oh. There can be a normalization of that type of treatment for the child. Yes. Now. Okay. We're moving right along. This next set of questioning is the impact on the child, the type of treatment and the abuse by the parents. How does this impact him? It's just it's just continuing on. Let's see if I got the right spot. Here we go. You see that they reported no behavioral problems when they enrolled him in to uh, Independence Middle School in Jupiter. Got a little. Um, I don't recall that, but I'll take it, take your word for it. Now I want to talk about Here the we go. impacts this type of treatment um, would have on a child. I think you've already said that it would exacerbate any pre-existing problems that the child may have correct what would um, the type of treatment the way this if you... now i'm going to let this run because i have it in my notes um it goes from 246 to 249 it was just really good and and it needs to be there was the way that he was kept and confined <laughs> correct oh yes would it also and isn't it true that it's your opinion that it will also make the child feel rejected correct Yes, it could. It make the child feel like they're not good enough, correct? Oh, my God. It, it make the child feel like they are inherently bad, correct? Yes, it could. It can lead the child to maneuver or manipulate through a situation to avoid that isolation. Yes, it could. It can lead to depression, correct? Yes. 
it can lead to suicidal ideation, correct? It could. When a punishment is chronic, meaning that it happens on an ongoing basis, you will see a bigger impact too, correct? For sure. Oh my gosh, this is brutal. I, I just thought this little bit of questioning was pretty brutal towards the defense because it's making him worse. They're locking him up. It's not helping him. So no matter what the defense has said, you can't minimize this, right? Is that That's what I'm getting. You just can't minimize being locked up because all of these other problems are acerbating the, the underlining problem that we started out with. It just made it worse. And as to the victim in this case specifically, you think that what was going on with him, the issues that he was having prior, was really exacerbated by how his parents acted towards them, correct? Yes, that's my belief. There is a psychological impact, um, a negative one, when punishment is humiliating and isolating, correct? Yes. Now, as to the appropriateness of the punishment, um, it's your opinion that you don't think anything that they did or attempted to do that they did would help him be better, correct? Sustained. Is it, it's true, isn't it true that it is not appropriate to punish bad behavior by placing a child in a situation where they don't have access to an ordinary bathroom? Yes. It's your opinion that that, that should never have been done in this case, correct? Okay, now notice she's saying is in your opinion now, remember when they were uh, examining the first psychiatrist where he was like, well, would you change your mind? And he'd say, no. Is it your opinion? So this is, to me, was like like the opposite of, of the two coins on, but similar type of testimony. I just found that interesting. Yes. That type of treating treatment is also humiliating, correct? Yes. The same is true for locking him from the outside. That is something that should never have been done, correct? Because the other psychiatrist would say no. Like he'd ask him a question, he'd say no. But this one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, I, just, I hope y'all catch that because I know y'all watched, some of y'all watched the other video of the psychiatrist and all of his was no, no, no. And hers is yes, yes, yes. I just, I just found that hysterical. A little humorous. There you go. Um, that's also true for his, the inability to control the lights. That is inappropriate, correct? correct? Inappropriate. That is going to have a negative impact on a child if it happens over a longer period of time, correct? Yeah. Having a child sit in the dark in a locked room for long periods of time is not an acceptable form of punishment. Ouch. Sustained. It is the type of thing that would cause harm, correct? That wasn't. Sustained. I don't know why they would sustain that, but... At no point is there any indication that these parents were advised to engage in this type of behavior, correct? I didn't see any mm -hmm. professional telling them to do that. And that's because it would be something that would not be recommended by someone within the mainstream psychological and psychiatric community. Yes, I'm glad you said mainstream, because absolutely there are many professionals that believe in a very militaristic type of parenting, authoritative type of parenting, strip everything out but their mattress, take their door off the hinges. There are professionals and paraprofessionals that do believe this is a way to parent, but people that are mainstream and that really know the research would never have suggested that. Right. And there's well, he seemed to be more militant on how... Tim Fe Timothy Federer, who I'm talking about, seemed to be more militant to me on uh, how he dealt with this. Okay, we're almost done. I got two more clips, and then we're, we we wrap this up. We're not doing too bad from a six hour because the rest of this is um, them discussing the jewelry instructions and stuff like that. Um, this clip is we're on redirect now. Redirect, direct. <laughs> The defense is up questioning her now. Um, and in my notes, I've got here, parents try to help child with, with different therapies. So they're going to, she's going to go over that. So I don't know where she's going with this line of questioning because obviously whatever advice they got, they still locked him up, but nobody told him to lock him up. 
I mean, he was on medications, um, this kind of stuff, and it just, it just never, nothing, nothing seemed to, obviously to them, nothing helped, so they had to lock him up. Mentioned, um, it sounds a little <laughs> Sicilian in retrospect, but something like transcendental meditation. Did the ferreters sort of try both medical and non-medical options over time? Overruled. You can answer. Um, yes, they did. They tried many different things. They tried putting him into um, like karate, and they tried chess club, and then they tried to burn his energy off with track. Um, they did uh, try. Let me stop you. Are, are you testifying from your review of the uh, documents that you reviewed as part of your opinion, or are you testifying from conversations with somebody? No, sir. I didn't have conversations. So, with all right. I, so I'm going to allow. I'm going to allow the answer. You can continue. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, they also tried um, putting him into a meditation class so that he could learn to control his behavior. So I think they tried, and they tried nutrition. They tried taking away gluten. They tried taking away sugar. I mean, there was a bunch of different things that they did try that were outside of the mental health world. Okay, so <clears throat> this part's interesting, too. Um, this next phase of questioning, where were the parents right? And the the psychiatrist gives a response is uh well when when he when you hear the videos of him screaming at the kid, so she's basically saying, Well, his tone was bad, but his message was good. I was like, Okay, okay. So and what he was saying to the kid was good. It was right what he was saying to the kid. We don't want you to be bad. We, we want you to grow up and be a good person. Now get back in that room. I'm shutting out the light. But uh, this, I'm going to let this play. And uh, it's coming up in a, a few seconds. So we're going to just go ahead and let it play. Because it will be at 2.54 on the timestamp. So here we go. Based on your experience sort of working with families and particularly children with the history of trauma and their parents, I mean, is that, um, I guess, what do you make of that? Was that neglectful of them and not pursuing every medical option? Or is it something that parents do, trying to sustain? Yeah, because that's what parents do. They lock them in boxes, oh, for Pete's sake. Um, the state mentioned the transcendental meditation, and you mentioned several other efforts that Ferreters made. Those are obviously not medical efforts, correct? Correct. Does that change your opinion as to whether or not they engaged in malicious punishment? This is good. No, it does not change my opinion. Why not? Um, I think that they... So she, she doesn't change her opinion because she doesn't think that they were malicious in their actions. Now... I guess I can see that, right? Some people are going to have that opinion. Well, they didn't know what to do. The kid's a little turd. He's doing all this stuff. We've got to lock him in a damn box. I don't know. I, I don't know. It kind of seems malicious, though. I mean, let me know what you guys think. They were trying the best that they knew and what, you know, what they... Sustained... Um, well, you know what? They could have asked somebody. Uh, should I, I've tried all this stuff. I tried therapy, sticking him in karate. Uh, we gave him acupuncture. I don't know if they did that or not. I'm just throwing that in. Uh, they should have said, well, hey, uh, nothing's working. Uh, should I build a box and stick him in it? I mean, they should have asked a, a professional. They didn't. They must have known this is wrong. They had to, uh, for good, for Pete's sake. I'm surprised the boy didn't tell anybody at school or tell his teacher or tell somebody that, yeah, when I get home, I have to do chores and then I get put back in a room and they lock the door on the outside. I can't get out and I'm going to the bathroom in a bucket. He never told nobody because I never heard any testimony that he notified the school. Well, obviously, there would have been a, an investigation, so he didn't tell nobody. It was found out because he ran off for the weekend. He just wanted to escape for the weekend, and then he shows back up at school that following Monday. They find him, right? Y'all remember that? He disappears. He run off. They call the police. And 
you know, and then the police find out all this stuff. We, the kid don't have a room. Oh, my God, he's got a room in here. There's a ring camera. Let's get the footage. But the kid showed back up Monday at school. Without what you think, um, the, the state's expert testified that based on the Ferreter's conduct, he believed that there was malicious punishment, correct? Finish the question. You hadn't finished. You, I hadn't gotten to. The, you hadn't gotten sure. to the question. So finish your question. Is there then. is there conduct that you have reviewed that shows to the contrary? Yes. Okay. And can you take us through how you've come to that opinion? Um. Yes. There is there is conduct by Tim that um. Here it comes. The tone is terrible. Tone is it's, awful. it's terrible. And how he's talking to the child with that tone is bad. But what he is saying to the child isn't horrible. He's saying, I want you to get better. I, I want you to make right choices. Sustained. Um, Your Honor, there's already in evidence. The jury watched the ring videos. Response. Uh, I remember one of the videos. It was, and so it was. As to that particular comment, I'm going to allow it. You can uh, continue answering it. Objection overruled. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Rapa. Um, he was saying, I want better for you. I don't want, I don't, you, people are going to not want to be your friend or be close to you if you continue to act this way. I want things different for you. And while his tone was bad, what was coming out of his mouth was not bad if he had been using a different tone. The state talked about. Um, so if he so if he went now, son, I, I want I want you to do good because people won't want to be around you and play with you. OK, so you need to behave yourself. But in the meantime, get back in the room and I'm shutting out the light. What the hell? That, this, that's, it's not even it's not helping them at all. Of, well, let me start with this. The state talked about the the effect that the Ferreter's actions had. You're not disputing that what they did was wrong, right? No. Okay. So let's sort of take it back to that 2018 period. Um, the state mentioned a number of different uh, school emails or referrals that had uh, sort of acts that had between 2018 and 2019. Is, is that fair to say? Yes. In, in cross-examination, they talked about stealing sprinkles, some fights that happened. Is that correct? Yes. First off, um, I mean, how are you, how does a, a psychologist separate what is regular childhood behavior from what is so concerning that it amounts to a disorder? Um, I think that what we look at is persistence. Is this happening over and over and over? Is it a pattern of behavior? And is this behavior <laughs> not going away even though school might be punishing or the parents might be punishing or, or giving consequences, the behavior continues to persist. Do you see that as it relates to in the records in this case? Yes. Do you see that in this case, uh, sorry, in the records as it relates to even prior to May of 2018 when Tracy got pregnant? Uh I'm going to overrule it because it's already been, the answer's already been made of record, uh, so it's really cumulative at this point. Yeah, that his behavior, he started having some bad behavior after the her, her baby was born. You can answer this question, and, I'll, and then I'll move on, Judge. All right, let's get through okay. this. The state mentioned that um, in in your work, this is the first uh, case that you've testified regarding malicious or allegations of bizarre punishment. Is that correct? Yes. Um, have you testified about early childhood trauma? Yes. How often? Oh, my word. <laughs> Hundreds um, of thousands. <laughs> a, a high number. I mean, I've been doing this for 20-something years, and, you know, I do trauma work. So a high number. Um, and... When you are sort of hired, do you work for both the defense and the state? I do. If you had to put a percentage on it, how often are you working for the defense versus the state? Um, right now, probably about 
and is that locally in I mean, she's just going to go on and ask her stuff like this. We're going to wrap this up. I mean, she's worked for the state. She's worked for defenses. <clears throat> we get it. She's a paid consultant. That's great, right? But I hope y'all enjoyed this. Um, it was kind of painstaking going through this. We are a little lengthy, but uh, it's okay. It was a lot of juicy stuff in there. Uh, let me know. What were you guys at? Uh, the defense does rest. They rested yesterday. Um, let me know how, what where, what side of the fence you're on on this case. And um, I'll be doing a follow-up video of the, um, obviously, of the verdict. Well, actually, I want to do, go over the um, closing arguments. That might take me a minute to do that because... They might go ramble on for 20 minutes and, you know, some, a lot of it might be repetitive. So I'm, I'm going to try to get the, the, the best highlights through the whole 20 minutes. Uh, my other video, I just did like three or four minutes of their opening and we, we got the idea. But I think in this, I think they're going to have more information since more evidence came out. The, the uh, closing might be really juicy. I'm hoping, it, I'm hoping it's good. But anyway, thank you for joining me. And have a great day, night, evening, wherever you are in this wonderful world. And peace.